Philippians chapter 1, this is, as much as I love all the books, this one just has this vibe of joy just spilling out of Paul. And what I want you to keep in mind when we're experiencing his joy is that he's in chains. He's in chains in prison in this letter. And the things that he says here are, are truly paradigm-shifting things that I hope we all kind of catch. And so let's pray, and we will begin our third book in our series. We finished Galatians and Ephesians, and we will begin Philippians tonight. Let's pray together. Father, in Jesus' name, we come to you. Lord, and as we open your word, we talk about what you've had your apostle write. Lord, we know that there's eternal purposes in knowing this stuff, embracing it, and walking it out faithfully, Lord. So we pray that we wouldn't just be hearers of your word tonight, Lord, but there'd be something motivated in our hearts to go out and do the things that you would have us to do, Lord, to spread your kingdom. And so, Lord, we particularly lift up uh, Israel tonight. And Lord God, as we just hear just horrible, horrible things over and over again that are very difficult to have come into our ears and eyes, Lord, we recognize uh, the good position you've put us in, and we want to use that good position here, Lord, to lift up Israel in prayer, to help in the way, any ways we can, Lord. And as you are our Prince of Peace, we want to pray for peace everywhere, God. And we want to pray for angelic protection. And we want to hear just miraculous stories, Lord, of escape and, uh, and eventually peace. So, Lord, do what only you can do and no man on this earth can possibly do so that you would receive all the glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Okay, Philippians chapter 1 now. This letter of Christian joy comes from the pen of Paul as he's sitting in Roman custody under house arrest. This is seen at the end of Acts. So the very last chapter of Acts, Acts 28, this is a kind of a two-verse description of the situation Paul's in when he writes Philippians. In Acts 28, 30 and 31, it says, Then Paul dwelt two whole years in his own rented house and received all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence and no one forbidding him. So that's how Acts ends, and that's a situation that he's penning this letter. This letter is written in the early 60s. I think most uh, scholars will put it right around 61 AD, which will be the, the final decade of Paul's life. He will lose his life midway through this decade. Paul founded this Philippian church about 11 years before this letter is written. He founded this church in the early 50s AD on his second missionary journey that you can read about in Acts chapter 16. In verse 1 and 2, we read, Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, with the bishops and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So regardless of the substance of Paul's letters, whether he rebukes in his letters like he seems to do with the Corinthians a lot, or he rejoices or blesses with his letters, he always sees at the beginning of his letters room for grace and peace to its hearers. He loves starting his letters with this offer of grace and peace. And with that heart of grace and peace for others, he now has the credibility both to rebuke and to bless, right? So, so even in rebukes, the question is, where's your heart? You know, what, what's the ultimate intent of your rebuking? It ought to be uh, wanting to result in grace and peace. So for somebody that instructs us so much in the things of God, it's good to know that he's somebody that's always starting off conversations with grace and peace. Now, verses uh, 3 through 8. He says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you with all joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ, just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as much as both in my chains 
and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. For God is my witness, how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. So Paul's joy is unmistakable here in these terrible circumstances. Paul can see prison and still see God's will playing out in his life. So as the prison doors shut on him, or he's actually in house arrest, he doesn't start wondering, hey, God, you know how effective I'm being. You know how determined I am to get across the world and plant these churches. You know that I'm very dedicated to you. So why would you have me in house arrest? Why wouldn't you let me go and do the thing that I'm doing that I've been doing so very well? This is, this is the exact situation in life. This or parallel circumstances where people start walking away from God, right? So I think it's important for us to know that Paul, if you can imagine, you've done nothing wrong, you're accused of of being a dissenter and all these things when all you're trying to do is preach the gospel, you're put in jail, you're very often chained to a guard, which you're going to hear Paul's heart on that. He's like, he has to listen now. So that's kind of cool, right? Can Can you imagine that guard? Anybody goes, hey, I have a question about the gospel. The guard's like, I can tell you whatever you need to know. I've heard this over and over again, right? So um, it's so important um, that we don't let our circumstances determine how we view God. And um, it's, it's remarkable that, that this is Philippians chapter 1, and I actually have a couple girls here from my class, and they heard me teach this from a different part of the New Testament, Luke chapter 7, and I'm actually going to get into that uh, section a little bit later. But I think it's vitally important, and believe me, I pray this for myself, that if my circumstances drastically decrease, that my love and trust of God increases in that. Because God is going to work through the trial. Okay? I might have my own set end that I want to happen, and it may not be his set end that he wants to happen. But... Um, trust, it's no big deal to trust God when you have it all figured out, right? That's not even really trust. It's when you don't have it all figured out that God's going to look at you and say, do you really trust? So Paul's in these circumstances. He writes this letter of joy through it. And he's overflowing with affection for his, for this audience, for this church. Now, He says in verse 6, he's confident that God who began this good work in in this Philippian church will complete it till the day of Christ Jesus. Now, I mentioned in Ephesians, and I want to bring it up again at the beginning of Philippians, that Paul, every time he says something great, it seems like he can't avoid using the name Christ Jesus after it. Jesus is the key that opens all the doors to blessing. Look how he addresses this audience. So when he talks about all these things of joy, who is he writing these promises to? To all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, okay? So this is to everybody who finds himself in Christ Jesus. I want you to think about Jesus' teaching in John 15. Jesus flat out says, I'm a vine and you're the branches. And if you start to grow fruit, I'll be faithful to prune you, which is not a pleasant process. The pruning is not a pleasant process, but what's the result of pruning? More fruit, right? So so God's going to take your good good ministry and he's going to trim off any dead branches on that so that those dead branches can now also be fruit-bearing branches. Not a pleasant process. It's probably under that category of Hebrews 12 discipline even that's not pleasant for the moment, but in the long run yields a crop. But uh, Jesus is saying, listen, you're a branch, I'm a vine. How effective are you going to be if you're not attached to me? Well, guess what? Circumstances are going to happen that you're going to question. And the question that's going to be asked of you is, was that a circumstance that detached you from the vine? Or did you stay attached to the vine? Okay. So um, in verse 9, he says this, And this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, 
being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So here he says, I'm praying that your love may abound more and more. And then he says, here's how I want your love to abound more and more, in knowledge and all discernment. So Paul attaches love with an increase of knowledge of him. So a lot of times, you know, you go on dates or, or you know, you, you, you get a new group of friends. And sometimes there's this fear that, hey, if they get too close to me, they might not like me so much, right? But if I can keep them at Martin's distance, I can kind of put the mask on and be who I think they're going to like and all of that. But I'm afraid if they really get to know me, they're not going to be too impressed with me. Here, Paul is saying, I'm praying that your knowledge of God, your discernment of God increases because that's going to increase uh, your love for him will abound more and more if you increase your knowledge and discernment of God. Discernment of God means this. It simply means you go outside, you hear the birds sing, and you literally are saying, ain't no way evolution created those beautiful voices, right? That's God, and listen to what he does every single morning. It, it kind of blows you away. He has them singing. Not a bad way to wake up, right? Okay. You can tell what I'm going through right now. Every morning, I'm literally listening to the birds out in my driveway. I have been. And I even have an app that you can record the birds, and it'll tell you what the bird is. And I've got five more days to delete it before I have to start paying for it. And <laughs> Diana's going to monitor that, right? Diana, so you've got to remind me. But I'm trying to figure out what these bird, who these birds are, what these birds are, and what the singing is. But listen, when you, that's part of growing in knowledge of God. Okay, it's part of the knowledge of God that he, I mean, just imagine if, if the raccoons were the singers in the morning, you'd be like, gosh, ah, such an awful sound every morning, waking up to these, this croaking or whatever, but he has it be the birds, and he gives them these, these beautiful voices to, to sing literally every morning, it's remarkable. I feel like you're looking at me like I'm weird, so I'm going to keep going. All right. Um. Growing in knowledge of him. Listen, I got to tell you, if, if there's a verse that describes my life, it's that one. I've been studying for almost three decades, nearly every day, and I got to tell you, it just increases my love for him all the time. See, God is somebody that does not have to keep you at arm's distance because he's afraid you won't like him. He knows that if you know him better and study him more and draw closer to him, that you're going to love him more. So... Um, and that's the, that's the purpose that trials serve for us. Because when we get in these trials and we need rescue or we need wisdom or we need these different things in these trials and we're leaning on God, not man, we're leaning on God for these answers and we feel like God has spoke to us through those things, now we know him as a wonderful counselor or we know him as a redeemer or we know him as uh, all these different things that if the trial didn't happen, you wouldn't know him that way. It's like if somebody, if one of you raised your hand in here and I said, what do you do for a living? You say, I'm a lifeguard. I'm going to go, okay, cool. What do you do? What do you do? But if I were drowning and he showed up and said, I'm a lifeguard, I'm not going to go, okay, cool. What do you do? I'm going to go, thank God you're a lifeguard, right? I'm going to think that's the greatest thing I ever heard in my life, right? So how are we going to appreciate Jesus as a savior? You got to recognize your hopelessness. You got to recognize you're drowning and he's a savior. You got to recognize that you have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And you have to realize that the wages of your sin is death. Now, look at Jesus. Embrace our sinful condition and then look at Jesus. You're going to see he's a beautiful, wonderful Savior. In Genesis 3, speaking of knowing him better and loving him better, in Genesis 3, after Adam and Eve's sin... We read this. It says, Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? Now, God is omniscient, correct? That means what? He knows everything. So why would a God who knows everything ask a man who just sinned a question? What does Adam know that God doesn't know? And the answer is nothing. But God chooses to ask questions, right? So he says, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And God said, who told you that you're naked? Two questions from an omniscient God. Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded that you should not eat? 
three questions from an omniscient God. Then the man said, the woman you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? Four questions from an omniscient God. And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Now the pattern would indicate that he's going to ask the serpent a question now, correct? But he doesn't. He says, the Lord said to the serpent, because you have done this. There's no question there. It's just a judgment. It's just a statement. Why? Because God has a redemptive purpose behind the questioning. He questions because he wants to redeem that heart. And questioning the heart tests the heart. He has no redemptive purpose plan for Satan or the fallen angels, okay? Now, I say that for this reason, because when the angels fell, they had no redemptive plan whatsoever. They stayed fallen. When man fell, God's willing to die to get them back, okay? God has a redemptive plan for us. He does not have a redemptive plan for the angels. Therefore, when we say God is our redeemer, and that comes from a heart of love and appreciation and thankfulness, the angels don't know him that way. They don't call him Redeemer, okay? They can call him God and God Almighty and everything, but they can't say, God, my Savior, God, my Redeemer, because that's not the relationship they have with them. But because we're fallen and we're stuck in this sinful world and he's willing to rescue us, we can say he's our Redeemer, he's our Savior. So because of our trials of sin, we know him in a glorious way of a redeemer. We know how strong his arm is. We know how capable he is of rescue from, 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 from sin and addiction and all these things. We know he can forgive it all and wash us clean and start us over again. And that type of knowledge comes from trials and that type of knowledge leads to increased love. Who's the one that shows up at the tomb, looks inside, two of them leave and one of them can't leave? Peter and John leave because we don't get a huge record of their sin. The one we get a huge record of sin from is Mary Magdalene, seven-time demoniac. Imagine all the wickedness that went with her being possessed by seven demons. She can't leave that tomb. She stays there weeping and weeping. And because of that great love, she's been forgiven much, so she loves not much, right? We're taught that by the Lord. She can't leave the tomb. And because she can't leave the tomb, she is the first person to ever see Christ risen from the dead. Okay? So uh, she knew Jesus as Redeemer in a very strong and powerful way. And because her love increased so much, that she couldn't even leave that tomb, uh, she got to be the first eyewitness of the risen Christ. So to know God more and more and more is to love him more and more and more. All right, verse 12. But I want you to know, brethren, that the, thing which, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. So that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. And most of the brethren in the Lord have become confident by my chains and are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So, Paul sees purpose in his imprisonment. And he says it's actually furthering the gospel. Now, in that prison cell, Paul pens the book of Ephesians this book of Philippians, and the book of Colossians. Now think of what those letters have done for our planet over the last 2,000 years. Okay, Paul's not even aware of all of that, but he says, listen, these chains are furthering the gospel. And he, I don't think he had any idea of how much those chains were going to further the gospel for him. What if he wasn't in jail? Isn't it possible these letters never, ever get written? Okay? So here, either... Prophetically, predictively, or some way, he, he, he mentions that this is serving a purpose. This imprisonment is, is serving a purpose here. Now, he says, this turns out for the furtherance of the gospel. Why? It's, not, it's become evident to the whole palace guard. In other words, there's something about Paul's imprisonment that's witnessing not just to the guards that are with him, he says, the entire palace guard's talking about me and the gospel right now. Okay, this entire palace guard. So, <clears throat> so they're chaining Paul down, but they're not chaining Paul's message down. His message has gotten to the whole palace guard, 
And, and, and I want you to think of the Roman centurion at the, the, at the crucifixion. That Roman centurion that said, surely this man was the son of God. That didn't come from a Billy Graham sermon. It didn't come from hearing Jesus preach. It didn't come from watching Jesus heal. It didn't come from being fed miraculous bread by Jesus. It didn't come because he had a child that was healed by Jesus. All that man did was watch the suffering of Christ and how he suffered. And as he watches that man suffer, he concludes that had to be the Son of God. Very curious about what he saw and how he interpreted that suffering. The suffering of Christ led to that man's recognition of, of who Jesus was. Paul is saying his trial is serving purposes for who Jesus is. So how do you suffer? How well do you suffer is a part of our Christian walk. It's a part of our Christian walk. Um, you know, we had a girl in here uh, last school year. Uh, as she sat here, I pointed out to you that it might have even been a Sunday service, I think, maybe. But I pointed out to you, she's been diagnosed, and I named nine things that I, I could never repronounce. I could barely pronounce them when they were written in front of me. Nine diagnoses that she's been under that prevents her from walking, from, from not passing out every now and again. Uh, things go out of joint, her, her feet turn in so she can't walk. She's got all these issues going on. But how that girl suffers has made me say over and over again to her over the last year that, that you are my hero. She's my hero. Because she's maintaining straight A's, she doesn't complain about a thing. She's got a dog that helps her around the school, she, or she's in a wheelchair. She's got a very loyal and incredible boyfriend that started dating her when she was healthy, and as she's declined, he's been by her side through the whole entire thing. Let me tell you something. What, is actu what those two kids are made out of has always been in there, but nobody could see it until the trial came. And now the trial's here, and you could see the quality of these two. It's how they suffer that witnesses so tremendously uh, to others. Um, I'm very much remembering right now, uh, I had a student, I don't know how long ago now, uh, maybe close to 10 years ago. He, um, he was, he's the only student that's ever been engaged to be married while he was still a CCA student. He, his girlfriend lived in like the Orlando area. They got engaged before he ever even graduated. And uh, I got to do their premarital counseling. I did their wedding. And it was a great wedding because he's, he's Russian. And we did these Russian aspects of a wedding and all that. And it was a lot of laughs, a lot of good and everything. And shortly after that wedding, she gets pregnant. They have a daughter. They're raising their daughter. It's wonderful. It's great. She's a few years old. They, she gets pregnant again. And now they're going to have a son. They deliver the son. And uh, there's something wrong with the boy's heart. And uh, long story short, uh, in those, the boy lived 59 days, all in the hospital. And in those 59 days, you know, the parents constantly being there and, and so forth, turns out that his wife literally fell in love with another man in the hospital and was leaving him through these 59 days of losing their son. And there was a day when some of the hospital staff came up to this young man and said, your wife is here with the other man. Would, do, you, do you want to leave? Do you want us to put them in another room until you're done or what? And he had just written a letter to his son, like a goodbye note to his son. And so he said, well, I, I'd like to speak to them, you know, and then I'm going to read my son the letter and then I'm going to leave. So they got them a room to meet in. Now, this kid is a kid who absorbed the Bible in my class he relentlessly pursued the Bible. His hand was always up. What does this mean? Say that again. Explain that some more. Uh, just loaded with receiving, receiving, receiving. Very serious about the Lord. And when he was going to meet his wife and this guy, uh, he said, I just, he said, I, I stopped and I prayed. And I said, Lord, I've been learning about you, asking about you. I want to follow you. I want to be. So what and, and, this, and Roger, if you ever meet him, he's like muscle upon muscle. He's like built like a tank. He was a track star for us. And he said, Lord, just help me not to tear this guy's head off. That's what I'm asking, just the strength not to tear his head off. And so he prayed that. He opened his eyes. They're standing in front of him in the hallway. And he said he felt this blanket of peace over him. And he looked at them. 
And he said, it was crystal clear to me that she was going to be with him and they were going to be a couple and that's just how it is. So he said to them, I want both of you to know this. He looked at the guy and he says, you be very good to my daughter or we're going to have more conversations. But in the meantime, I forgive you both. I wrote a letter to my son. I'm going to go read it now. And he walked away. And he said he was able to heal in incredible ways after that and, and all of that. So now I have watched this kid. And by the way, a very good friend of his is uh, making a film career for himself. He actually did a documentary on this story and it won an Emmy Award, an actual Emmy Award. Uh, the, the story's called uh, Arkady, because that's his Russian name, Arkady. And um, it, 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 I held the Emmy in my hand, it was incredible. Uh, they won an Emmy Award for this story. And why, why is it a good story? Because this young man submitted himself to the Lord and his deepest, darkest pain, and ended up saying something very godly and behaving very godly. And, that, and the God allowed him to heal and not become a disaster through all of that. And how he suffered and how he chose to handle his suffering is why I'm mentioning him now, why a documentary was made about him, why there's an Emmy Award about his story right now. Okay? So, it's, it, it's not too tough to be a Christian when, lit, when it's just going to church on Sunday and then maybe icing on the cake as you come here on Wednesday nights. The question is, who are you in your suffering? Who exactly are you? How does your spouse know you when you suffer? How do your kids know you when you're suffering? Because it, it's, it's going to be a far different suffering if you're trusting the Lord or if you're not. If he's the same God to you when you are very happy, if he's the same God when you're struggling, then you're suffering well. But if all of a sudden he's a God that you're not so sure about and all that, then you're not suffering well. Okay? So we see these examples of actual Christians, of the Apostle Paul, and of course of Jesus Christ. And they become life-changing stories for those who are watching. So we see verse 15. Paul says, Some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains, but the latter out of love, knowing that I'm appointed for the defense of the gospel. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and in this I rejoice, yes, and will rejoice. So, Paul's gospel, as Paul's planting churches, and Paul certainly has some notoriety, not only from his preaching, but also from his persecutions. So he's known one way or the other. That's the guy that keeps getting himself thrown in jail. That's the guy who keeps getting himself beaten. That's the guy who keeps changing people's lives. And if you're making idols, he's the guy that's ruining your idol-making business with his preaching. All these things he's getting known for. And so as people see his notoriety go up, some, now they see that he's locked up, they start preaching, Paul says, some are preaching from selfish ambition. They're like, I'm becoming the next Paul. I can catch up to Paul's success because Paul can't do much in jail. And so Paul knows some of these people are preaching from this pretense of their own personal promotion. Thank goodness that never happens now. Okay? So... So that happens. And he says, but there's also people that preach from goodwill. They really, really want you to know Jesus. They really want to tell the story of Christ. And they really had Christ do something in their heart that they're just like, hey, now that's happened in my heart. It's like you don't have any choice. I got to offer it to other people and, and see if Jesus will do something in their heart. He's saying some do it from goodwill, some do it for pretense. And then when he says, what then? He's kind of saying, so what do we make of that? What do we make of this dynamic that some are preaching because they're, they're literally competing with me and they want to get the crowds and they know I'm not getting the crowds while I'm here and all this. So they have this selfish ambition about their preaching and some are doing it for goodwill and some people are probably thinking, so Paul, go get those guys, man. Go get them. Support these guys. Go get those guys. He says, no, listen, they're preaching Christ. God will deal with their heart, but they're preaching Christ. Okay? So when... Jesus' followers started seeing that he was chewing out the Pharisees a lot. Remember, these are the Pharisees that people would sit down on Saturdays and hear from in the synagogue, right? 
And now they're seeing the guy that they're following is criticizing them a lot. And they start going, so should we go listen to him? Should we not listen to him? And Jesus said, listen, they sit in Moses' seat. So do what they say. He says, but they're also hypocrites and don't do what they do. Okay? So Paul here is saying the same thing. If they're preaching from selfish ambition or whatever, they're preaching. And the preaching's got the power. Okay? But just don't do what they do. So he says, as long as Christ is preached, because God is going to deal with the motivations of all of that, isn't he? God will deal with the motivations of it all. So because of that, Paul says, then I am going to rejoice. He says twice. Um, I'm going to rejoice about that. Now, Paul can rejoice over that, but as we learned in Galatians 1, what he can't rejoice in is when you preach a different gospel than the gospel of Jesus Christ. So there he says, even if it's an angel from heaven given a different gospel than the gospel of Jesus Christ, tell them they're damned. What if it's an angel from heaven? Tell them they're damned. Okay, the gospel of Jesus Christ has got to stand. But if they're preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, then God will deal with the motive of the heart. He's just thankful that Christ is being preached. Now, so Paul says this is going to serve to further the gospel. People think they're stopping me by putting me in house arrest, but it's actually serving to promote the gospel because he's writing these letters to these churches. He's, the, he's already impacted the whole palace guard. And this is what we, we call a Genesis 50-20 situation. What does Genesis 50-20 say? Yep, it says what man intended for evil... God intended for good, right? So he's taken that which man is actually intending for evil and he's going to work it for good. Should Genesis 50 be part of our prayers for Israel? Absolutely. Okay. All right. Now, about this, I saw a quote from A.W. Tozer. Let me pull it up real quick. I promise you I'm not checking the baseball scores. <laughs> All right, about this competitive preaching and false mode of preaching, A.W. Tozer, in the form of a prayer, he said, Dear Lord, I refuse henceforth to compete with any of thy servants. They have congregations larger than mine, so be it. I rejoice in their success. They have greater gifts, <clears throat> very well. That's not in their power nor in mine. I am humbly grateful for their greater gifts and my smaller ones. I only pray that I may use to thy glory such modest gifts as I possess. I may not compare myself with any other, nor try to build up my self-esteem by noting where I may excel one or another in thy holy work. I herewith make a blanket disavowal of all intrinsic worth. I am but an unprofitable servant. I, I gladly go to the foot of the cross and own myself the least of thy people. If I err in my self-judgment and actually underestimate myself, I don't want to know it. I purpose to pray for others and to rejoice in their prosperity as if it were my own. And indeed, my phone did something funny. And indeed, it is my own if it is thine own. For what is thine is mine. And while one plants and another waters, it is thou alone that can give the increase. It's a great perspective on it all. Okay, verse 19. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Now, he's saying something that he knows about his situation. He's saying, I know this is going to turn out for my deliverance. Okay. I don't know how he knows or why he's thinking that's going to go in that direction, but he says, I know it's going to turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ according to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed. Okay? Now, of course, every time you see Paul use that word ashamed, to me one of the most powerful things he says ever is uh, Romans 1.17 after you know, being uh, beaten and jailed all these times and all these struggles he has. He says in Romans 1, 10, uh, 117, he's, or in 116 and 17, he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, 
for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now Paul had lots of reasons that he could have used to say he was ashamed of this gospel. Okay? So he started off a Pharisee of Pharisees, and this movement of Christianity opposed the Pharisees. So he could have said, I'm ashamed that these people are doing this against their Pharisaical leaders over here. Okay? He was constantly beaten up over this gospel. He could have at some point said, you know what, at some point it's not worth it anymore. But Paul never did. Okay? So he's given reasons over and over again why he could just, just said, I'm, I'm done with this gospel. But he says, no, I'm not ashamed of that gospel. Why? He says that gospel is the power of God. That's why Paul says, I don't care their motives for preaching. As long as they're preaching, guess what's getting out of their mouths? The power of God. The gospel is the power of God for salvation. It's for salvation. People get saved when people bring the gospel to them. And it, it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Okay? So whatever system of understanding uh, salvation, there's Paul's. There's Paul's. It's the gospel, it's the power of God, it's for salvation, and it's for everybody who believes. Now, being unashamed of the gospel creates the boldness that gives us the stories that we see we can only credit to God. Being unashamed of the gospel is how we get the stories in our lives that end up witnessing to the rest of the world and as we talked about already, even or especially in suffering. We've literally seen the suffering of the believer transform people into believers. So no matter what happens to us, no matter what situation we find ourselves in, that very situation can be used by God to further the gospel in your life. Okay? If you want to say how, I would say I don't know that anybody that suffered in the Bible well knew how while they were suffering. The stories get told afterwards, right? They get told afterwards. But we walk by faith, we walk by trust, and if faith and trust are only a part of us when things are going well and we understand things, then we really don't have faith and we really don't trust. Faith and trust are manifested in the ones who have it when the world would say you have reasons not to. That's when it's manifested. Now, verse 19, again, I just want to point out as he talks about salvation, I want you to be aware that Paul will speak of salvation in three different ways. In the pa as a past event, as your present reality, and as a future event, he will mention salvation. For example, Ephesians 2.8, you all know, for you have been saved by grace through faith alone. Past tense verbs, right? You have been saved. You received salvation. Okay? Philippians 2.12, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. A present reality, you're in salvation. Then you get to Romans 13.11, which says, he, Paul says, for now our salvation is closer than when we first believed. <laughs> so it's just something that's going to happen in the future about salvation and it, it's closer to us now than when we first believed, okay? Philippians 2, work out that salvation that you currently have with fear and trembling. And then you have been saved by grace through faith alone, okay? Past tense event, okay? So in other words, you in the past got saved at a certain point in time. Your salvation is constantly, organically working itself out through your soul, changing you more and more into the likeness of Christ as you walk faithfully with your salvation. And then I think the Romans 13 verse is talking about the salvation event when you will actually see Christ face to face, your salvation. So what exactly would you be ashamed of with that? Verse 21, he says, now as he's in prison awaiting sentence, well, verse 20, he says, according to my earnest expectation that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. Can you imagine visiting him? 
saying, Paul, did you get your sentence yet? No. Uh, what might it be? I could be set free. I could stay in here till I die, or I can get my head chopped off. Oh my goodness, that's intense. Yeah. So how do you feel? Um, bold. I feel bold. I feel Christ being magnified. He's going to be magnified in my body, whether they take my head off of it or not. He's going to be magnified in my body. Okay, whether by life or by death, he says. And this has been extremely impactful for me over the years. He says, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is... How can he say gain? Do you have that worldview? Listen, do you understand what the Bible says about your resurrection from the dead? Okay, that your best day on earth is nowhere close as good to your worst day in heaven? Do you understand you're going to be in glory, you're going to see the Lord, and everything in the power of God to make your existence perfect will, will be fulfilled. So when we look at somebody like Paul, who God you know, met on the road to Damascus and changed his life forever on that road and then showed him things of heaven, that guy says, yeah, I'm waiting sentence. I don't know if, what I'm going to get, but you know what? I might get death. It's like, <laughs> okay. He understands fully his death means absent from the body, present with the Lord. Okay. Listen, we know how to say this, but we, do we know how to feel this? There is no fear in death. There is no fear in death. What I say about the first verse, if you are in Christ Jesus, that is the key to everything. If you are in Christ Jesus, then you have no fear in death. In fact... I want you to consider Paul's perspective here. Paul's perspective is, I mean, if we read another verse, it'll make the point even deeper. So the next verse he says, for me to live is Christ. I'll go on ministering Christ if I live, but to die is gain. He says, but if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. So if, I, if they let me live and let me go, then I'm going to bear more fruit from my labor. Yet, what shall I choose? I cannot tell. How I am in Chinese restaurants about picking food, he is about living or dying. He says, it's all good. I don't know which good I want right now. Okay? If I live in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. Yet, what shall I choose? I cannot tell. For I'm hard-pressed between the two having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. You big pain in the necks, okay? You need to hear the gospel more. You need ministry more, so they might let me live. But if you guys all figure it out, then God will be free to take me. Now, you think that's a real dynamic? Go to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7, starting in verse 18, John the Baptist is in prison. So listen, the power of perspective. Perspective changes everything. When I counsel people, one of my main goals is to change their perspective on the situation that's driving them nuts. To see it in a way that has hope and power attached to it so they are empowered to do something about their issue. Okay, perspective changes everything. Paul's in prison. He goes, the whole palace guard's getting saved. Isn't that cool? Okay? Paul's in prison. He's going, I'm writing letters because, man, I got to talk to these, that Ephesian church, that Philippian church, that Colossian church. I got to talk to them. Guess what? I got time now. Thank you very much. Okay? So his perspective is leading him to joy, but he might get the death penalty. I know. How great is this? Right? Now let's look at another great man of the Bible, John the Baptist. He's also in prison now in Luke chapter 7. He's in prison in Luke chapter 7 and verse 18. The disciples of John the Baptist reported to him concerning all these things. All these things are all the miracles that verses 11 through 17 talk about. Jesus healing the blind, the deaf, the lame, raising the dead. 
He's doing all these things. So two followers of John the Baptist report to him saying, Jesus is doing all these miracles. And John, calling two of his disciples to him, sent them to Jesus to say, are you the coming one or do we look for somebody else? That's John the Baptist. He's looking at his jail cell and going, I don't know if Jesus is who I announced him to be. I pointed at him and says, he's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I called him the bridegroom. And I'm just a friend of the bridegroom. I said, he's the one whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to untie. He's the one that as I baptized with water, I said, he's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire. He's that one. But now John's circumstances changed. And now John's perspective changes. From the inside of a jail cell, John says, maybe he's not who I thought he was. Okay? And what does the Bible tell you? Jesus is in the midst of healing miracles. And it's specifically naming the blind seeing, the deaf hearing, and the lame walking, which if you were a first century Jew, you would know from Exodus chapter 4 that God said to Moses, Moses, who makes man's mouth? Who makes his mouth either speaking or mute? Who makes him hearing or deaf, blind or seeing? Isn't it I, the Lord? He's saying only the Lord can do those things. And Jesus is doing those things, meaning Jesus is who? He's the God of the Exodus. In John 8, when he says, before Abraham was, I am, they picked up stones to stone him to death. Because what did they hear him say? I'm the I am of the burning bush that told Moses, my name is I am. Okay? So the God of the Exodus, the God of the Old Testament, is, is one and the same as Jesus Christ. Even though he calls him father, he calls him son. Well, then how can that be? I don't know. But it is. Okay? Now, so Jesus is doing all these things. And when the men had come to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to you saying, are you the coming one or do we look for another? And that very hour, Jesus cured many of infirmities and afflictions and evil spirits. And to many blind, he gave sight. And Jesus said to them, go and tell John the things you've seen and heard. In other words, what I'm doing speaks perfectly of who I am. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. That's straight out of Exodus 4, that only God can do those things. And blessed is he who's not offended because of me. You notice how Jesus put that on the end? Go tell John what you've heard and seen, but if he wants a quote from me, here's my quote. Blessed is he who's not offended because of me. Now let me tell you something. Jesus is going to go on to say to the crowds, those guys leave to report to John, Jesus still has the crowds in front of him, and he says to those crowds, there's not a greater one than John the Baptist, but the very least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he is. And you know what he does? He lets John stay in jail and die. Why? Because he just said, he's the greatest on the earth, but the least in the kingdom of God is greater than he so Jesus knows the only way John can be greater is not by getting out of jail and walking on the earth again, but by going straight to heaven. And because Jesus can see the whole picture of our earthly life and our heavenly life, and to him it's just a promotion. It's not a tragedy. It's not a sad thing. It's just a promotion. He lets him die. Okay? He says, John, don't be offended at me because I ain't coming to get you. And don't be offended at that. Because as soon as your head hits the floor, literally, you're going to know that this was a favor I did for you. That you're actually better than if I got you out of jail. This is actually a better thing for you. Do you have that perspective on death? It's still sad, right? It's gonna be sad, okay? It should be sad, okay? I literally did a memorial where mom and son didn't even cry over the death of the husband and dad. Terribly sad to see that. So it should be sad, but Psalm 116, verse 15 says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Your death is precious to him because right now, he intended you to be with him right now, but because of sin and the fall, he's separated. So he works a redemptive plan to get you back, and your death is the fulfillment of his redemptive plan. So of course it's precious in his sight. Okay? But what does Paul say about death? If he leaves me on the earth, it's because I have more fruitful ministry to do. And as long as you have more ministry to do, 
then this is where you belong. Okay? Perspective is everything. Look at John the Baptist's perspective on jail. Look at Paul's perspective on jail. And it's Paul that still sees the, pic the whole picture, the whole kingdom picture, even though his circumstances changed, his God did not. John's circumstances changed, and suddenly his God changed too. Can't be that. Okay, can't be that. All right. 27. Uh, let's see. No, I'm, what am I on? 24. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. And being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy of faith, that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. He doesn't see a single selfish benefit for him to go on living. He sees massive benefits for others if he goes on living. So he says, even though I'm dying to meet Jesus Christ, I saw him once, can't wait to see him again, but more fruitful ministry for you. Therefore, I know God's going to leave me with you, and I'll have joy in that. All right, 27. Now, with all of that, that perspective on death and heaven and dying and all of that, he says, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. So he says, with this ministry that I'm giving to you, now make your conduct worthy of the gospel of Christ. And watch how he unpacks that worthiness. He says, so that whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and not in any way terrified by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition, but to you of salvation and that from God. Now, he says, when people disagree with you because of your Christianity, see that as proof of their perdition and proof of your salvation. In this world, you will have trouble, Jesus said, right? But take heart, I've overcome the world. You're going to have both the trouble and the overcoming. You're, that's both are part of the Christian experience, right? The trials and the overcoming and the trials are both, okay? So don't be terrified by your, adver your adversaries, which is to them proof of their perdition, but to you of your salvation and that from God. For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ. Now, the you in here is in the plural. So who, what's the group he's referring to? He says, for to you it's been granted. Go back to verse 1, to all the saints in Jesus Christ, right? The in Jesus Christ. That's where all your benefits come from, in Jesus Christ. So now he says, to you it's been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. You want to talk about a change in perspective? He says, it's been granted to you to suffer. Okay, a grant is something positive, right? Right? It says, I'm grant, it's been granted you to, to believe and to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here is in me. Paul seems to be quite confident that if people, people faithfully walk out the things that he's saying, they're going to end up in jail too. He knows if you do this well and you do this right in the atmosphere that you're in, you're probably going to jail. Okay, so you might experience the same conflicts which you see in me and you hear in me. Those are likely to be yours. So who are you in suffering? Suffering is a worthy conduct of a Christian. He says, let your conduct be worthy. Why? Because you're probably going to jail sooner or later. You're probably going to be beaten sooner or later. You're probably going to be persecuted sooner or later. And when that happens to you, let your conduct be worthy of Jesus Christ, who suffered for you, who died for you. Suffering is a worthy conduct of a Christian. I gave you, I gave you uh, John 16, 33. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I've overcome the world. Now, who is Paul to speak to us about preparing for suffering and to suffer well? He, he was challenged on that a lot because as he calls himself an apostle, what do you think he heard from the crowds? I know Matthew, Mark, Luke, I know Andrew, Philip, Nathan, I know, who are you? You weren't one of them. You were never with them for the three years. 
Why do you call yourself an apostle? So Paul defends himself in 2 Corinthians 11. He says, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more so. And he's talking about the 12 apostles. He says, I've been in labors more abundant in stripes above measures. What are his stripes? Brutal lashings. Those brutal, brutal lashings. I've been in stripes above measure in prisons more frequently, in deaths more often. From the Jews, five times I received the 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I've been in the deep. In journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils of false brethren, in weariness and toil and sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and in nakedness. Besides all that, what comes upon me every day is my deep concern for all the churches. Do you know how much we complain when we just have sleeplessness and that's it? And everybody's got to know about it and that's the excuse why we're not doing our jobs well and that's why we're going to bed early, okay? That's the only, we need, that, that happens to us, the world needs to know, right? Paul says, listen, here's my relationship with Christ. I have suffered more than all of them. You want to know what my resume is? It's suffering. You want to know why you should listen to me? Because I have a resume of suffering. Okay? And then in Philippians 4.11, I'll finish with this. With all that suffering, how much credibility does Paul have when he says this? He says, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need, because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Okay? I have been a pretty loud um, opponent in our athletic department of any athlete having the verse on their shirt saying, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That is not a verse saying, I'm going to dunk a basketball, score a touchdown, or strike somebody out. That is not the strength promised to you. It should not be used uh, for, to promote an athlete. Paul just went through how his faith was unwavering through get, getting whipped with whips and beaten with rods and stoned and left for dead and all these things. Why? Because I can do all of that through Christ who strengthens me. I can suffer well and I can suffer brutally to the point of death, even death. I can suffer all of that because he strengthens me. It's not about dunking basketballs. Okay? Because what suffering's coming my way? What suffering's coming your way? And that's going to be where the rubber of your faith meets the road of reality, right? Okay? God does not change when circumstances change. Okay? God is God most high all the time. Amen? All right. So I want you to remember, all the suffering that we just talked about, this is, in Paul's letter, known for its great joy. Let's pray. Our Lord, we come to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, our Redeemer, our Comforter, our Strength, our Rock. Lord, we know you in all those ways, and in each and every one of those ways, our love increases for knowing you that way, Lord. So we pray there wouldn't be a circumstance that could destroy our faith, Lord. There couldn't be a circumstance that brings us to doubt and confusion about you. Lord, we know who you are. We know you're so good to us, and we know, Lord, that when we are faithless, you are faithful. When we can't be trusted, you are trustworthy. And so, God, we pray that your word would fill our hearts, it would create in us strength, Lord, to love, to follow, and to obey you all the days of our life. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.